DMC World visits Brighton, East Sussex, to catch up with Norman Cook, who used this very beach, where he lives, to create one of the biggest DJ gigs in UK history. Fat Boy Slim talks about his quite amazing career, right here in this building. Young Norman Cook was born Quentin Leo Cook uh, in Bromley. I grew up in Rygate, which is in Surrey, about halfway between London and Brighton. I was sort of born in the 60s, grew up during the 70s with like glam rock. And then just as I was coming of age, punk rock came along, which is fantastic because it ripped up all the rule books. You were allowed to have a bash at anything. You know, here's a guitar, form a band. I was sort of playing in punk bands and I was also DJing just simply because I had the record collection. So I used to get in, invited to parties because I had a record collection. And then one time I, I got invited and I said, I'm not bringing the record collection because it always gets covered in fag ash and vomit. And they said, well, what if we, uh, what if my parents hire you these double decks and then you could like be the DJ and keep control of your records so they didn't get damaged. And I did and I really enjoyed myself. The crowd really enjoyed themselves. So I became a DJ. And then I moved down to Brighton just when Planet Rock came out and uh, there was this kind of electronic dance music, discovered funk. And so I think I, I grew up at a very good time for punk rock ripping up the rule books of everything I knew about pop music and then, and then dance music kind of re-establishing the new rules, which involved not needing to be a musician, you could just be a DJ and then they invented the sampler and the drum machine and I was straight in. My original DJ name was DJ Ox, the Ox that rocks, uh, which was in the days when you had to have a, a hip hop DJ name. The kids would get into it and the whole break dancing side of it. And though I was DJing in clubs, there was all my mates who were underage who couldn't get into the clubs and, and so we started doing hip hop jams, which um, at the time was just kind of a, a, a bit of fun and, and I don't know, we were sort of trying to in Brighton recreate the block parties of Africa Bambata with varying degrees of success in, in kind of village halls. But it was, a, it was a really good, again, a really good time for the DJs to be breaking rules about what you could do with turntables and what the idea of, of, of music was. Having kids coming up on the mic and rapping and, and, and break dances. Very exciting times. The grapevine before the internet literally was that. It was a grapevine. It was James Hamilton's column in Record Mirror was one of the, the few people who was writing about the music we did. That was probably the biggest source of information. There'd be like Bronx tapes, we used to call them, cassettes that would come over, people would bring over from America and we'd hear all these crazy beats being cut up and then we had to find out what they were. I think one of the reasons we floundered in the UK was we were always kind of copying the Americans, um, but secondhand, because we didn't have YouTubes. I remember hearing the first time about scratching, I'd heard Adventures on the Wheels of Steel. And then some journalist said, oh, I went to the Bronx and I went to this block party and he was picking the needle up and repeating the phrases by picking the needle up. <laughs> I spent the next three months trying to scratch by picking the needle up. Nowadays you'd get it on the internet. Um, and also, for me, I mean in those days, nowadays we call it dance music. In those days we called it black music. Uh, it, you know, funk and blues and soul and everything were all very much a black music and white people didn't on the whole make it. But in those days there was quite a hardcore of people who were doing it. And we all sort of knew each other, and, but it was before the days where a DJ would play around the country, you know, I'd occasionally play in London, or you get to hear about people in Bristol and London. But there was, yeah, we were, we were kind of this, uh, not an oppressed minority, but we were the minority of the, the people who were cutting up records in our bedrooms, and we all kind of were aware of what the other people were doing, but without the, the freedom of the internet to be able to sort of talk to each other, there was kind of sort of graffiti conventions and things like that where we all meet up. I do have to say, at this point, that one of my greatest friends and allies was Shem McCauley, Streets Ahead, who sadly passed away last week, who is quite pivotal in the scene. DJ Baptiste wasn't actually a DJ, he was an MC, but his name was David John Baptiste, so whenever we went to do gigs, people got confused because I was the DJ and he was the MC, <laughs> an MC called DJ. Um, and he wanted me to change my name to DJ MC just to really confuse people. DJ was my, my flatmate and he was, yeah, he was the first rapper that I worked with. Um, you say there was a hardcore amount of people in England who were doing that at that time. There was a very small hardcore in Brighton. There was literally 30 of us. 
and uh, we also kind of knew each other. And DJ was one of the few people who had had the bottle to actually get on the mic and rap. And yeah, for me as a DJ, to have a rapper to be able to cut, cut up for. I've always said the biggest influences in my life were probably The Clash and Grandmaster Flash. When I first went to the parks with this, I figured, well, I'm playing the best part of all these records, back to back, back to back. So when I do this, when I go out in the park, everybody's going to be excited. When I first went out in the parks in early 74 and tried it, everybody stood quiet. I never forget, I went home that night, kind of was crying a little bit. I said, damn, I'm playing the best part of every record. When I did it, it took me three years to create it. And when I showed it to the people, nobody really understood what it was that I was doing. The Clash were the first kind of white rock group to incorporate dance music and kind of hip hop culture. And Grandmaster Flash, because the minute I heard Adventures on the Wheels of Steel, I'm like, this is what music should sound like. This is how it should go. On the electronic side, Giorgio Moroder who kind of invented house music with I Feel Love and the stuff he did with Donna Summer. And then Arthur Baker, he bridged a gap between what was going on in the Bronx and what was going on in Manchester, Hacienda, and he saw a bigger picture and got everyone and 808 in the same room and, and magic happened. Obviously all the Def Jam stuff and Rick Rubin stuff when that came out. The House Minds was a kind of hark back to my youth. Paul Heaton, I'd been in bands with him when we were at school in, in Red Hill, and he moved up to Hull and I moved down to Brighton, but we kept in touch. But in those days, I kind of felt that being a suburban white kid in England, I felt my role in life was to be in a suburban white pop group. Because before the invention of the sample and the drum machine, uh, white people making black music, to me, always felt a bit wrong. Think level 42. And so I just felt that my kind of heritage meant I should be in a white pop band. And it was while I was in the house minds that all my old mates, like Cold Cut and everyone, started putting records out and getting in the charts. And that's why I left the house minds, because I was like, no, this is the music I love. This is what I want to do. I don't want to be in a pop band. After the house minds split up, I went south to Brighton, thought, what am I going to do next? Um, and the first thing I did was went back to DJing. And I had a friend at Cool Tempo who had the rights to I Know You've Got Soul and said, what would you do if you wanted to kind of re-release this? And I think it was just after Paid in Full that Cold Cut had done. And I said, oh, well, you kind of mash it up with something. And I did this little demo where I put the Jacksons, I Want You Back, on it. He said, he said, oh, that's brilliant, will you do it in the studio? And I'd never thought about actually sort of remixing a record in the studio. So he put me in with Danny D, who was a very influential producer in those days. And so the first three productions I did with Danny D, and the three of them were hits, and it launched my career as a remixer and a DJ. Literally kind of within months of leaving the house minds. And again, lucked out at a very, uh, broad-minded time in, in, in music where everybody was remixing and chopping things up and sampling and no one quite knew what the rules were because we were making them up as we went along. The DJing side of it had always been dominant in my life. They say, you know, why did you switch from being in a band to being a DJ? And I said, actually, I was always a DJ, but in those days, being a DJ was a hobby. It wasn't really a career. And uh, when, before I joined the House Martins, I was DJing five nights a week in Brighton, but still had to work in a record shop during the day to pay the rent. So before the, the, the era of the superstar DJ, it wasn't, you couldn't actually make a living out of DJing and there wasn't enough work to do it full time. So I, when I came back to DJing, it was great that it had gone overground and obviously DMC magazine by then became our new grapevine, which kind of brought everybody together and then took it internationally. Uh, the Ibiza thing, I think it was before the real age of the, of the superstar DJs. So I mean, obviously it was Alfredo was, I think Alfredo was the one because we thought he must be kind of more authentic because he's Spanish and lives on the island. No, I'd, I'd just end up seeing my mates, Carl or uh, Darren, um, Pete Tong was always on. Uh, I was normally kind of 
being naughty in the back room though, rather than getting involved with the main, main room action. So I used to go to Ibiza, but I couldn't get a gig because I didn't play house music until Manumission one year decided to put me on in the back room and it started going off in a slightly different way, not straight forward to the floor, but a bit funkier. And at the same time, we'd, I'd gone to this club in London called the Heavenly Social and met the Chemical Brothers who are kindred spirits. And rather than going up to London every week, we started our own club in Brighton called the Big Beat Boutique. And which was fantastic. I mean, and to this day, I mean, if you think that house music is named after the warehouse club, garage music is named after the Paradise Garage and Big Beat music was named after the Big Beat Boutique. Obviously not such an enduring style of music, but it's nice to have it named after your club. I thought about entering the DMC competition a few times. Uh, that I actually judged Carl in it. I was never quite really good enough. I thought about doing it a few times. I even had my little kind of segment worked out. But then I'd go and watch people like Pogo and Swift and think, Rah. and also share the streets ahead. He was really streets ahead of me and um, yeah, no, I, I kind of thought of the production role rather than the DJ. And, and like I said, you know, the first remix I did got to number three in the charts. So I had this whole new career as a remixer. Once I'd kind of got a name remixing, then my record company, who I was still signed to, said you should put records out. So I put a few records out as Norman Cook featuring. By this point I was doing this DJ show where we had rappers and percussionists used to, Luke Creswell used to play bongos over the top of the records and that kind of Norman Cook featuring the world and his wife was too much so Beats International became the name of our crew and we released Dubby Good To Me with, with Lindy which became a, a sort of a, a global hit. This is jam hot, this is jam hot. Which um yeah, which for, for me was just like all my Christmases at once. This is like, I had a taste of, of, of pop success, but playing bass in a band, I didn't really care for the music. And now this is what I want to do and, and you know. And yeah, I got quite overexcited, probably got a bit over, over egotistical. Had a bit of a, uh, and then, but then House came along. And at first I didn't really kind of, I'd been still in, in, the, in Hull, in the House Martins when House came. And I came, I moved back to Brighton and all my mates have all got these bandanas on and all we're going, get on one matey. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So I was still playing kind of hip hop and rare groove. Uh, and it took me a little while to get my head around house music because I thought it was too fast and it wasn't funky enough. But then kind of had, a, had an epiphany at a boy's own doing in uh, Bogner, <laughs> where um, I think uh, Darren Emerson was playing two copies of I'll Be Your Friend. And it's just going, I'll be here, I'll be here, I'll be here. And I'm coming up on a pill and all of a sudden it's, I get it, I'll be your friend. And yeah, so then I wanted to make house music. So Pizza Man was born out of uh, a house alter ego, even though I was still doing Beats International. And then I worked out I could have one record out on that label with a band and one record out on that label that was me but wasn't me. And then the floodgates opened and then the mighty Dubcats came out and then I could be in Freak Power and be Pizza Man and the Mighty Dove Cats. Again, maybe some ego problems going <laughs> on there. And then I had another alter ego called Fatboy Slim, which just devoured the rest of them. Just ate the rest of them and spat them out. After being in the music business by then about 15 years, I kind of thought I'd seen everything and done everything. But the fat, when the Fatboy Slim big beat thing took off, it just kind of went up a pace to you know, having a number one single to having a number one album. And then also I met Zoe, my wife, and so we became this sort of celebrity couple. And yeah, my life kind of changed uh, in a way that I could never go back to being like this sort of DJ who hid under different aliases. And it, I kind of got, got outed and, and there was sort of no going back. Halfway to the gut and the stars was described exactly how I felt at that moment. <laughs> Cause I was kind of, you know, DJing at the Oscars party, but still getting drunk and thrown out. <laughs> so it's like you can take the boy out of the gutter, <laughs> but he'll only get halfway to the stars. The idea of a DJ as the superstar, um, I'm kind of stuck, again, I'm halfway between the gutter and the stars on this one, because I kind of, having lived the life of a superstar DJ and, and occasionally got paid 
stupid amount of, of money. You qualify it by saying you put bums on seats. Uh, but I'm constantly embarrassed that I might get paid 50 times more than another DJ that I'm not 50 times better than. And in fact, I might see DJs who technically are way better than me. But it's kind of, it's about bums on seats. It's about the personality of the DJ. Uh, if, you've, you know, if you do something that no other DJ can do, then people will come and see you. And, and you know, if people like it and they're putting bums on seats, then you'll, you'll uh, generate the money, which like you said, the promoters will only take if you don't. Um, all I can say is maybe try and spread the love in some way. Uh, and I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm quite humbled sometimes when I see other DJs and, and you know, who, or the poor DJs who kind of do the beginning of the night when there's like 10 people in the room. And you think, you would rock this room when it's full. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you, you just try and help out the, the, the new talent. Right now.